Hey, it's Mazzy here. And this is, um, we're going to showcase some album cover artists. And I'm here with David Ellis out of the UK, a designer. Welcome, David. Hello, hello. Good to see you, Mazzy. And I'll let him introduce himself. Um, what we're going to do, we each chose five artists. They could be designers, graphic designers, photographers, illustrators, uh, crossover that we like and obviously there's so many more there's a couple obvious choices i picked and some personal obvious choices but there are so many we could we could go on this you know pick 10 20 30 of these possibly but um i want david to introduce himself he's in london and i want him to uh, introduce himself his design background and and why we're collaborating on this okay well um thank you thank you mercy for that introduction um yeah i'm a graphic designer i'm um I was born in 1962, so I'm not a youngster. Um, and I've grown up through lots of with lots of record collecting, and really, perhaps one of the reasons I'm a graphic designer is down to record sleeves. It's my certainly my first experience of understanding what um, um, graphic design is. Perhaps I think it was uh, probably people like uh, Roger Dean in the 70s that kind of hooked me into an art form that I'd never really considered before. Um, and um, my background in graphic design, although I've designed some record sleeves, I've designed many other things. So corporate identity, books, um, I do a lot of exhibition work, I work for the v &A in London, and I do um, uh, just a lot of different things. I, I like the variety, you know, um, a friend of mine who did move back to LA uh, in the, um, 90s to work on uh to work for a music company said he just got so bored with doing just that little square of a cd that he just yearned to do something bigger you know so i've done some big architectural stuff um like putting type in, in built environments working with architects so the variety is good for me but uh, um there's there's still something about music sleeves which uh, I, I hold very dearly and uh, so it's, it's good to talk about them Although it's a bit weird for me to talk about other people's design work, but I'll give it my best shot and try not to represent, not to misrepresent it. So that's great because uh, we're you and I are somewhat close in age. I got you by about eight years, but um, yeah, this the thing about us, the visual uh, arts. This is for me, and for you, it seems like uh, the introduction we got to visual arts aside from television, advertising and magazines, Life Magazine, that generation are, were album covers. And when I get into my first one, I'm gonna let you go first, but when I get in my first one, it's one that really kind of started it off for me. Just a look quickly, uh, those of you who watch my channel already know most of this, but um, from 73 to 80, 81, I was in the record business retail first and working for labels, promoting it. And I can always consider myself an artist without a discipline because I'm not really talented, but I, I think I have a good eye and I've developed a good eye. And I fell into in 1985, 86, I became a photography agent. So I represent uh, a stable of commercial advertising photographers uh, who mostly do advertising corporate work. But when I started because of my interest in record companies and record covers, Several of them I pushed into the record thing. So we did record covers for Columbia, Sony, uh, for Electra Records, Warner Brothers. Not a lot of big ones, but there's a few uh, mild ones uh, we did with them. One of my favorite experiences, we did one for Electra and non such records for Kronos Quartet. And I had to go to that shoot because it was in San Francisco and one of my photographers shot it. And the designer was Kosh. And if you know Kosh, Kosh did Abbey Road and let it be and all the most of the Linda Ronstadt records and just hearing him you know having worked with the Beatles an Englishman yeah. in Los Angeles so uh, that's where I'm coming from from the visual side of it and I collect artwork and art books and um, so that's where I'm coming from so David's going to start we each chose five artists and it will take it from here let's go okay okay uh so uh well there was a big list of people that i could mention but then um i kind of thought there's one or two i probably just shouldn't leave out um and one of the most obvious ones for me uh is peter saville um which is one of my kind of earliest touch points and and i wanted to kind of talk a little bit about kind of context so um punk came along and then almost 
as quickly post punk came along and and for me you know there were there were album there were album covers like this um so that's the undertones and um one of my early favorites uh was elvis costello um and there was this whole kind of um visual language developed to do with kind of slightly noisy slightly riotous you know um not very polite people shouting at microphones so there was like bands photographed in black and white photographed in industrial side streets there was torn paper there was like badly rendered type or type that had been like Xerox and Xerox and Xerox again, so that it, it had been distressed. There was a whole kind of language of that. But then along came uh, this. Uh, so this is my kind of original copy, which is pretty worn now. But um, within the context of all that post-punk music, this was just like, what the fuck is that? You know what I mean? There's like no artist title on the front cover you know what is that you know um and, and then you know there's this tiny bit of type on the back um so it's joy division unknown pleasures you know and graphic designers before this would have taken the title joy division and unknown pleasures and had some kind of knee-jerk reaction to do something a bit sexy at least with the typography but no he uses like universe which is like the the typeface you find in signage systems in in airports it's just pure information there's no it's almost stylistically neutral to kind of take any of that connotation away um and it, i find him an interesting designer because i mean this this was a, a pulse i think this was a a trace from I made a note so I wouldn't get it wrong. Yeah, didn't he didn't he kind of reverse that out? He took it from an audio pulse. Yeah, so so it's a um do, 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 uh, a data plot of signals from the radio pulsar. Right. Uh, and, and it was it, it was it was yeah it was black on white but he wanted to give it that like it was a signal coming from outer space hence it's quite small on the cover I think and reversed out of black. Um and I think there's a, a kind of, he was the first person I came across who kind of had his own way of doing things. Probably um, Hypnosis and Storm Thorgerson had done other things, but within this genre, he was the first one that came along with, who was almost like, um, he was one of the founding members of um, uh, factory records effectively so right. you know he's um it's a small kind of cottage industry they don't have a marketing person they're just like who can do the sleeves peter's really good let's get peter to, to, to do them and then he just does what he wants and he really and he really went to the, the the fine art museum thing didn't he also do the uh, new order cover the flowers he, he yeah yeah out. exactly well the, the, i mean the one that you know comes after this is uh, again it, it right that I picked is, is, is this um, the second Joy Division one, Closer, you know, and this is so, um, this is so classical, you know, when you, when you think about the music that goes inside, the context of, of doing this on that is, is so kind of exceptional. And um, like, you can go looking for this. I remember going looking for this typeface when I was young and you couldn't, couldn't find it because he found it in like an old 1950s type specimen sheet. And it's the type of typeface that would be written um, like stone cut onto mem memorials. This is why he used it mm -hmm. to go along with this particular image of a, of a, um, a crypt, I think. Has um, a whole alphabet of that typeface eventually been developed? You know, and, and I, th I think it, I think it has sub subsequently, yes. But he he just um, photographed it letter by letter and just built up the the type for this, um, and it was really kind of out there at the time. I remember kind of seeing it and just again going like, "What the fuck's he done now? Like, <laughs> where's this coming from?" You know, and it and it just set up a whole kind of presence for that those records coming out of factory, which was just like. 
we take ourselves very, very seriously. This isn't, we're not messing around here, guys. You know, this is, this is a very kind of pure form of communication. And it kind of imbued the music with a kind of a seriousness as well, which I think the, the two just kind of work very well together. Like there's a really earnest intention going on here that's kind of beyond kind of fashion or... I, I really like that small label design collaboration that um, I won't mention any names now because you or I may show some of them, but that artists like, uh, like Seville worked with one label and that it, the label had a, an image and had a look. And there was one, I think, that you might bring up that I didn't include later on that you and I first connected on, I think, uh, yeah. you respond on a video I did. Uh, when that guy died and um, it, but he really represented that label strongly. It was such a strong image. Yeah. Everything you saw about that, like people were buying the albums, whether the artist was, they didn't know the artist or not, just because. Yeah, of their, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. In, in and when California, you get like a kind of, a kind of uh, school or yeah. a kind of um, group philosophy like that, sometimes in, and you're buying records because you're interested in that label. Every now and then you'll buy one and it completely surprises you because it's, in, in it's the, not just more Coast, of the same. Yeah, and we had a guy in the West Coast. He did some album covers, but he did more magazine work you probably heard of that I remember loving his design so much. And I'm not, I didn't include him because I don't even know if he did album covers, but is David Carson. And David Carson, oh, yeah. these magazine designs. And I remember they were so beautiful, but every time I picked up one of his magazines, or spe- I couldn't read anything. You, yeah, well, he used to do Ray Gun, Ray Gun magazine. That's it. That's and it. Um, before yeah. then, uh, Beach Culture. I remember buying right. Beach Culture. I have some old copies on the on the on the shelves here. Um, yeah, and uh, interestingly, he didn't go to art school at all. He wasn't trained as a graphic designer. Right. I I don't know how he fell into that job, but I think yeah, he was interesting because he did a lot of things that most graphic designers would go, "You shouldn't be doing that." You break he the rules. Had, the rules yeah usually yeah. people say well you got to learn the rules before you break them but he just went straight to the end game no um but he was clearly you know is clearly very gifted visually yeah. so it kind of works um so these sleeves he did and and i don't think this was his original choice of a, an image for this album i think he wanted a different painting but he couldn't get the rights to use it from the museum that, that owned that to give him the was rights. that the national portrait gallery some of these so. yeah yeah um and this is a kind of a juxtaposition between between this and this so um it's really kind of like old meets new and the front being a kind of represents representation of power corruption and lies um I, I mean i wrote a note down but I, I find it kind of a bit like post-rationalizing in a way um he said Da-da-da. the flowers suggested the means by which power corruption and lies infiltrate our lives because they're seductive um but i suspect he tried out various kind of classical pictures and just found this one work sometimes you just trying stuff out and something unexpected just kind of works in that way. And then he just des- he developed this kind of way of breaking the alphabet down into colors. And so the band name is kind of written, oh, sorry, the band name's written here, although you'd be hard pressed to actually read it. And there's nothing written on the back. And it's like a floppy disk too. And, it? and there's nothing written inside. Yeah, well, the this, this thing is a reference to kind of floppy disks that kind of modern, modern music was stored on in those days. So right. in a way, I mean, my old copy's got a tear on it, sadly. But um, yeah, and that, you know, that came along with this, you know, this one, which is, you know, very famous. Uh-huh. Um, do we do we do? Which again I think that's my no, favorite, no I think text, my favorite no text Peter at Seville all. record. I think that's my favorite Peter Seville uh, album cover, yeah. that album. The, the, the flowered one, corruption. The, 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 uh, the corruption, yeah, I think so too. Um, but again, because it was done in a way that um, it was, they, they had no marketing department, they didn't really know what they were doing. Apparently these things cost more to, to print than they were making by selling a record. So every time they sold one of these, they lost a bit more money. Wow. Because of yeah. all this die cutting going on and uh, all the specialist stuff, you know, what they could sell a 12 inch single four, this costs more. So 
as one I've of the many with, ways I've, that I've New Order lost designers. money, I think. Yeah, I've worked with designers over the year. There's a bit of a delusion of grandeur. They want this great piece and it's nothing to do. It doesn't have any uh, sense of what the budget is, but they want yeah. this guy in these special pockets and vellum. It's, I remember when vellum intros were big. I did a whole promo book at the time. So, hmm. yeah, it's it's a common it's a common issue. Um, there's, I mean, I I pulled out a few more bits of of his work. There's there's like this, which which is um, a Ultravox single, and um, I mean, this is just this is just a page from a chart from a printer's chart, which shows you know if you want to you know, get that perfect purple there, that you take 60% um, cyan and 50% magenta and you mix them together and you'll get that color. But it, it kind of fitted what he wanted to say with visions in blue. So he was very kind of happy to just take stuff that he found that just kind of fitted. I mean, this, this was quite famous, this new order cover for movement, which, you know, is, got him lots of i don't know some slightly bad press over here but um i mean this this is the cover of a futurist italian futurist um uh, publication which he he just kind of appropriated because it, it kind of it was an art movement he wanted to pick an art movement so he wanted to pick an art movement that was about the celebration of modernism all things modern like the Bauhaus or something like that he picked Italian futurism and he just appropriated the graphics for this in, in in the way that another graphic designer will just find a photograph and think that's perfect I'll use that you know he had no kind of qualms so about doing get that. the license for it that's <laughs> yeah well in that case it's probably out of copyright so right. okay. oh, of course in, yeah yeah and that is all right, well, I'm going to start up with a very obvious choice for me because this was the visualization and it starts to me with this photograph. And um, this is the photographer, Robert Freeman, British photographer, who uh, Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, had seen some of his work, some Coltrane pictures he did. And of course, uh, the cover of this album and the States, we had meet the Beatles with the Beatles uh, was this very graphic amazing photograph and the irony is this is recorded i mean this was taken in about a half hour in a, a south england they're on tour the beatles and uh, they were in a hotel hallway and this is just natural light like it's a perfect studio like a chiroscope yeah. i guess you'd call it lighting style of just a the natural light coming in one side window not put together it, it when i remember seeing this on meet the beatles I thought it was so bizarre, the scale of the heads, like, is John really so much bigger than Paul? And, you know, the <laughs> way they're flo yeah. these floating heads and they're wearing these black turtlenecks and it's just a beautiful image. Yeah. What's great about I mean, Robert, did, did, did people read something into that? Like, you know, John's, people, John's bigger because he's more important or? I, I, who knows? People read something and everything, you know, I mean, going, yeah, we, we could get into that. But what's great about Robert Freeman, what's special, and I had the luxury or the honor of meeting him several times and corresponding with him, and I have several of his uh, photograph, is he had also a real art direction uh, background too. And he was very important in the vi visualization. Remember, like unlike later years with artists that we talk about, there was no vision of, aside from Brian Epstein putting them in suits and their haircuts and that accidental mm. haircut from Germany, from Astrid Kircher, and, but they kind of went along. And, and out of all their album covers, Robert Freeman photographed five of them, which is not quite, almost half their catalog. He came up with this, Hard Day's Night. It's great black and white uh, pictures, very graphic. And for the end of Hard Day's Night, for the end credits and help, uh, Robert Freeman designed the end credit things with those heads uh, around yeah. and I just love, I just love this. I mean, I I just love these covers amongst my favorite. Of course, he did this one. Yeah, feels for sale, and the graphics of this, and of course, at the very end, he created that the scene when they're uh, doing a, a, the um, uh, I think the Rosini classical piece is used at the end of Help. Da -da 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 yeah. And where there, you see the uh, red ruby of the ring and 
they're photographing it set in the fractals, almost like a, uh, through that, that was created by Robert Freeman as well. And these great pictures. And of course it leads up to this. And mm. what was amazing about this is uh, those of you who don't know, this was in a way an accident. He, he projected this picture uh, to the Beatles, a series of photographs he took in a, a park in London. And he had a piece of cardboard in a room and the cardboard was convex concave and it was curved and they loved that. It kind of slipped down and it, it wasn't flat and they liked the curvedness of it. So he printed it that way. And ironically, this is I think the first pop album release that didn't have the artist's name on the cover uh, when it came out, just Rubber Soul. Okay. And um, one little extra thing, I think it's really important to show. A lot of people probably out there don't know this came with this book. This is a signed copy of this photograph that Robert Freeman created. And this was his entry or his submission. This was going to be the cover of Revolver. This was his cover okay. for Revolver. And of course, the Beatles end up using Klaus Vorman, who took apart some of these images and included it in his collage for the cover of Revolver. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, what might have happened, I think they made the right choice with Klaus Vorman's cover. But this is an interesting uh, take. Uh, it would have been a six yeah. out cover. So uh, Robert Freeman to me is important. He's not a household name like some photographers. He didn't have an illustrious career in the same way. He did a lot of commercial work over the years. He moved to Spain in his later years. He just died uh, in 2019 uh, in London finally. But um, uh, really love his work. And uh, I mean, this is just a great graphic that it's got that great mid 60s kind of Carnaby Street vibe, I guess, but only in black yeah. and white. So Robert Freeman is my first submission. You're on, okay. David. Nice one. Okay. Okay. Well, um, leading on from Peter Saville, uh, it, it made perfect sense to me to um, to talk about Vaughan Oliver, um, who uh, I discovered when I was at art school. So um, what year did this come out? This is... Um, 1984, um, so I'm like a, uh, a year into doing my Bachelor of Arts um, degree and um, my friend John Gorse came in with this album and we were just like, whoa, that is, you know, we haven't seen anything quite like this before. Um, and as, I've, as I kind of followed his career over the years, um, his kind of sensibility pushed that whole idea of, of the designer almost as, as the artist into much more kind of personal degrees. I mean, um, Peter Saville would do things which were kind of linked, far more linked to um, individual flavors of different bands and things sometimes, or, or just his own particular things he wanted to get off his chest in terms of pieces of, of de design. But um, I think, um, Vaughan Oliver, um, he he became someone that really kind of shaped the style of uh, 4AD records, and um, um, his work with Nigel Grierson, and uh, they kind of formed a kind of group they called 23 Envelope or uh, V23 later, and so they didn't even put um, designed by Vaughan Oliver, photographed by Nigel Grierson. They would just put a a joint credit for both under V23, because I think the kind of who did what becomes very blurred in, in that instance. Um, I mean, I've, I've done some things where I've worked very closely with photographers where um, most of the content of the photograph is a kind of graphic content. So um, when you're trying to kind of claim who does what, it becomes quite, quite difficult in a way. And I think that was probably quite a good move by them. I think ultimately it probably it has some problems along the way because um, quite often they would create these images which are almost indestructible. It's like where do you put the where do you put the type on here where well, there's room, you know, um, or they become legible or um, um, but it, things like this. I mean, this particular record is um, you can't you can't tell what she's singing about. They're words, but it doesn't make sense in terms of a language. The, the guitars are kind of layered and affected and there's this kind of veil of kind of mysteriousness about it. And, and for me, the kind of graphics just felt perfectly a mirror of that in that 
it felt like a really like an emotional response to what was on the record rather than how do we sell this who's our target audience what are they currently buying you know oh they they bought the stranglers album last week so let's sell them something that looks like the stranglers album you know that typical kind of marketing guys kind of like rationale for doing things that kind of can only see what's been done before sometimes whereas this was just purely the band give give the artist some some early takes of it or some you know maybe it's nearly finished and he listens to it and he reacts to it and this is what you you get out the other side of it um yeah, he was that artist then, we, i was referring to that we yeah talked yeah about. exactly okay, so, as one. so when when he died you know very suddenly i was i was very shocked i i'd only met him once really um he sent i pulled out this he sent me he sent me a postcard once which is this Belly. With, with just a little little bit of text on the back and and it's very odd it says to sally gunnell and david ellis a dog's not a dog till he's pluto vaughn and in brackets we've never met but we share the same space which is very hmm. sweet and I, I met him sometimes afterwards and i said sally gunnell's a, an olympic swimmer and I don't know her at all. <laughs> why have you sent me a postcard addressed to myself and Sally Gunnell? And he said, well, I'm not quite sure why I did that. He said, I must have been a bit pissed. Uh, uh, drunk uh, for the American I, I know it's um, <laughs> I'm well versed um, in pissed wankers tosser uh, vocabulary. There. <laughs> you, you're, you're very up to speed. <laughs> I spent... Um, and sorry, I've, I, so I pulled out a, a few more. I mean, his, his work for the Pixies... I think um, shows a kind of interesting thing where he could um, he could take something with more energy. It's kind of uh, do you call it surf rock, post punk, surf rock, punk. I don't know what you'd call it, but um, it's 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 more it's more direct um, than than his work for uh, um, the Cocteau Twins and. Um, yeah. He uses he uses fonts which are quite hard to find. Again, he's he's um, PMTing old font manuals. He uses lots of quite um, um, he uses lots of fonts which are, are quite kind of romantic in a way. But because he puts them with kind of really distressed images like this, they cause a kind of a tension be between the two, which is very interesting, I think. Um, this one's printed in kind of pure Pantone ink, so it's not um, CMYK like you would normally print. Um, so that where the where the inks overlap each other, you get secondary colors and things. You know, this was a time. These his work was a time that I was getting into my business as a photo agent, and I was falling in love with this kind of stuff. And I was trying to seek out uh, artists and designers that were doing these. Uh, off kilter things with manipulating images because I had two photographers that were working a lot with original Polaroid negatives yeah. and uh, doing everything from split tone, sepia tone, uh, selenium tone prints, and they would, uh, or even uh, uh, Polaroid transfers, but they'd work with designers that would take parts and pieces and do these major, like you said, manipulations. So it wasn't a pure photograph. And I yeah, love it. Was it was pure. I mean, it was before Photoshop, so everything was right, exactly. much in, in 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 camera, and um, you know, and like building little sets and photographing them, and then layering graphics on top was kind of layering meaning in, in into the sleeves and Photoshop putting wreck, 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 <laughs> yeah. wreck the organicness of it a little bit. Exactly. Little bit. Exactly. Um, wow. And then, I mean. I think, I mean, apparently this is Vaughan himself modeling some eels strapped to his waist. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think, I don't think this is, um, I don't think this is him. I mean, some people have compared it to kind of, he's a bit Hitchcockian, like he likes to appear in some of his sleeves. I've got uh, a feeling it's just lack of budget. It's like, we don't have a model. Uh, okay, I'll take my shirt off, I'll do it, you know fuck it it doesn't matter it'll be blurred it doesn't doesn't matter who it is i'll do it i've got a feeling that's what that's more about than him being a kind of it's all about me me the ego um 
So this is I'm um, sure. I mean, bought by do, the breeders. What's great about it, budgets do come in because when I worked uh, in the late 80s into the 90s into record covers, it really ran the gamut. If you worked for like a Wyndham Hill record, you'd have a minuscule budget or an indie. With, if you worked for a Columbia, depending on the artist or sewn, you'd have a bigger. It really ran the gamut. So you make do and you try to be creative. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Photography as well as the art direction. For sure. Um, yeah, and yeah. When I when I first left college, uh, I was asked by a guy called John Pash to go and work at Chrysalis Records for a month while his second in command was on, I think, paternity leave or something. Uh, and so I was very excited, but I was a I was it wasn't the, the best experience for me because it felt very much like um, the band. There was the band, there was the marketing department, there was the band's manager, there was someone else in the record company, and they all had like an idea of what it would, would be. And then there was the designer. And it was like a battle. And somehow you had to kind of get through there and get something out the end that you kind of vaguely felt like you would put your name to in a, in a, in welcome, a, in a good, that's a like good a, you know welcome to the world of commercial advertising too many cooks and you got the account person wanting this and, exactly, and then the client exactly. and then, have a aesthetic the client is there wanting their version my my the best thing one of my photographers said to me is you know you sit there and you talk to the client and you listen to their ideas and then you come up with an idea and somehow this is where psychology comes in you you set, you give them an idea, but you make the client think it's their idea, <laughs> and you say, "Yeah, great," and you know we'll do it. And and the, we did have a problem in those days because my photographers were shooting film, and film more film you shoot costs money uh, now digitally. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, so I used to do these estimates, and okay, you can use you tell me what you need, but okay, I estimated thirty rolls of film or whatever. If you go beyond that, we're in trouble. So uh, you have to just kind of do it their way and your way if you can and they end up liking your way usually ultimately because their their idea a lot of times is watered down it's a safe way and not the way they really want it but of course advertising is different than uh, yeah, record yeah yeah so i i kind of i found far more kind of for me compared to working at chrysalis i found other, other places that were far more felt far more creative than this but i think um i born oliver working for 4 ad you know, he he kind of had an autonomy which you don't get very often in in the music industry. You know, um, um, it's not surprising that so many sleeves have just got a photograph of the band on the cover, and they don't even want to be photographed. It, it looks, you know, what I mean, They're, it can be a little bit half-hearted, or or they look dreadfully pretentious. Where you know, like right. some of those U two covers, where you know. One's in the foreground looking here and one's in one's looking up there and one the anton you know, corbin photographs yeah yeah exactly yeah. Uh, he, well he's you know he's a good photographer but still yeah. you know it's 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 not an easy thing or, or like that oasis sleep where they're all in an apartment and they're all like doing strange things one's lying on the floor and one's i actually like, like you know, that better than the u2 for some reason in a way like those yeah. better the U2 uh, album covers, I think they're great, but they seem a little self-conscious to me. Um, yeah, but. yeah, exactly. But, you know, it kind of comes from a whole thing of like, the band is a product. We need to put the product on the front yeah. of the packaging. And and this whole kind of methodology is like, it's got nothing to do with four spotty guys from Sheffield or whatever band, you know, it what they look like or don't look like, has got nothing to do with it. Uh, I mean, this is um, uh, a compilation for 4 AD. Uh, lonely as an eyesore and other things like um the sleeve for, for color box i mean color box are an interesting band because they use lots of kind of samples and and references from other musical genres um so i mean this this is part of if you go if you've ever been to a printers and you see them printing a job to get the ink up to a decent level They'll run like a thousand sheets through the through the press just to get the ink level right. So it's rather than waste, use, it's just a wasteful thing printing. Isn't yeah, it? it's totally wasteful. So what they do is they have a bunch of old paper that they've used before, and they just print your job on top of something else. So ah, you suddenly perfect. see your beautiful design on top of a bit of strange packaging 
which is on top of a report and accounts. And they've all been laid on top of each other. And this is exactly what this is. This is a running sheet that Vaughan Oliver found in the printers and thought, oh my God, that's beautiful. We just need to put the band name across the top because it, it talks, because the music, you know, includes these kind of samples of voices and different musical genres. And, and to him, this kind of strange, almost arbitrary collage seemed to just fit that perfectly, really. Nice. Yeah. And uh, a few others, um, ultra vivid scene. And... Um, I forgot about them. I have just a CD of theirs. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is one that I kind of, I remember hearing this, I remember being quite surprised because this is quite kind of folky, quite singer-songwriter, um, Heidi, Heidi Berry. Do you know this? Well, yeah, you know I, have, her? I have her CDs. In fact, I have her CDs and I'm a big fan of the stuff he did, uh, This Mortal Coil. This Mortal yeah. Coil is the, it's basically a yeah, lot of- another 4 AD doing the cover of a lot of folky stuff on there. They do Gene yeah. Clark songs and uh, yeah. Exactly. Emily yeah. Harris. So I remember buying this probably because it was a 4AD thing and being quite su surprised by it in a way. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, I'm not gonna grab it, but anyway, I have, I have her, okay. her solo records. I, I mean, I have yeah. those, yeah. Uh, and the final one I pulled out was a kind of a much later one, which was uh, for Johan Johansson. Oh, uh, which nice. is this kind of strange classical piece, which uh, neoclassical artist. I know him. Yeah. yeah which um, is called IBM 1401, a user's manual. <laughs> and wow. it includes um, these voices from this kind of user tapes that used to come with this mainframe computer saying, now you must load mm. the capstan on the right hand side, making sure for the tension and things like this with this big orchestral kind of pieces and these strange samples. Um, but this is a thing, I don't know if you can see it. It's all kind of embossed with- Oh yeah, yeah. With- um, A texture to it. Te textures to it. And um, the, uh, the inner sleeves are all again, very, um, have a beautiful kind of um, collages of, of kind of, numbers and data and um, all things relating to the computer. I think that's Johan Johansson's father used to operate one of these computers. That's where that whole project came from. I have later, got I, have, it. I think I have two or three albums of his, the later stuff, but the non-such, I forgot who the neoclassical yeah. label is on or something. Not yeah. non-such, um, the Deutsche Grammophon maybe or something. Um, I'm going to jump in and yeah. follow what you talked about of artists that collaborate uh, collaborate with visual artists that collaborate with musical artists because there are a number of bands where the you know the artists like uh, I, I didn't include um, uh, Talking Heads but David Burns a good example of how he works with these collaborative things I did not include him at all because he's not, he, he knows what he likes and very specific but I did yeah. want to include uh, Stanley Donwood and the collaboration with uh, with Radiohead, and um, Stanley Donwood is sort of his uh, moniker for Dan Rickwood is his real name, and he went to school with uh, Tom York Art School. You know, a lot of bands there's a segment of bands that come out of the art school scene and they grow together. And I think um, mm. he did his first cover on an EP called My Iron Lung EP for uh, yeah. for Radiohead that was his first cover and from then on he's done all their covers and uh, at, at being a visual collector uh, this just I literally just got this last week and this is uh, you know they did this is anniversary that, is that the one on cream yeah is that the one on cream vinyl yeah I've got I've got one of well those no no th this is a different one this is the book version yeah and, no I've got that same one oh yeah I just let, let yeah. I got yeah it is exactly and, and it's so it, big, it uh, won't fit on my regular shelves. No, of course, nothing fits. That's the thing. He, and, and what I like about uh, Stanley Donwood will do these large, full, literally full size scale, you know, eight by 12 feet or 12 by 12 feet canvas things he'll be painting in the studio while the band is in some cases recording the music and building on it. And, and, and what do they, um, how do they relate? This is the one where they combine Kid A and Amnesia, you know, and uh, just do these beautiful panels. 
how do they relate to the music? It's more of a mood. It's uh, more of a, uh, this is another one in rainbows, uh, you know, these multi sets, which I think are gorgeous. And some of it's about environmental landscapes. Obviously this is, well, see CDs fall out, you know, it's not a, not a yeah. good way to do the visual. So I'm not, I'm gonna skip that one for now and make that CD. And of course there's moon shape pool also, uh, a, a limited edition book. And then he did Adams for Peace with, which is the um, more electronic yeah. album he, they do with um, their producer, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Nigel. Ni Nigel. Nigel Godrich. God. Yeah. Um, and what's, what's interesting about this, I believe this is 45 RPM. And I think for the first month I owned it, I played it at 33 and didn't really know the difference. <laughs> you know, it's one of those. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got an album that I did that to. Although it's, I mean, it's more forgivable because there are there are no vocals on the album that I was doing it to. Yeah, but, but it but that that bugs, bugs the hell out of me when when they don't write the bloody speed on the on the label anywhere. That just the label, the cover, nowhere. And I and I just <laughs> and then I was reading something that it's at forty five. Oh, really? So I put it on. It seemed a little long. I did that on another one recently. Oh, the Balmeray album. Balmeray on Deutsche Grammophon, but but oh, yeah. I love when an artist, a visual artist, grows uh, with a band. And you know, as a photo agent over the years, there was a period of time I was doing a lot of record covers. Then that whole business for me fell away because they were only using the A-list celebrity people, the Annie Leibovitzes, the Herb Ritzes, the you know whoever the you know uh, La Chaparral, the, the fashion and celebrity yeah. photographer or they were using friends of the bands growing up with REM growing. And I get that. And so my artists, I would say, I had to say B-list, but we, they were, we're known in the ad world, we're known in the design room, but they don't have the budgets or, or even though we would do them for less, they don't really come to us at that point. You know, if you're do, shooting Taylor Swift, she wants the, the, the celebrity person probably with some exceptions, yeah. you know? So it's just a, a, it's an area of work that's dried up for me. And just evolve. Plus, the packaging uh, things, you, as you said, with CDs, got really different too. So, yeah, that's my yeah, choice. For sure. Um, do you have this? Do you have this book? It's um, it's a Vaughn Oliver book. Um, I do not. It's it's written by uh, a journalist or a writer called Rick Pointer, who's he he writes about design better than most writers I've ever I've ever come across. Um, and there's a little there's a little bit in here he wrote about um well actually first of all there, there's just a quote by Vaughan Oliver I was just going to read out do you mind if I read this yes um so he says um Oliver's a designer whose most characteristic work is about music at their most expressive his designs embody the intense emotional responses to his sensations as a listener this is by no means always the case with designers and music graphics. Reed Miles, creator of 1960s and many classic covers for Blue Note, never had much enthusiasm for hard bop, even though fans regard his graphic rhythms as perfectly in sync with the music. Uh, ba -ba 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 uh, he says, Peter Saville, designer of Sleeves for Factory Records, was engaged more with the subcultural stylistic and fashion aspects of post-punk milieu than than the music itself and this is and this detachment can be seen as a conceptual control of his designs for oliver the connection with music is much more visceral and intimate music is a way of twisting the moment leaving the mundane reality of the here and now the world of bills on the doormat and attaining a more vital state of being beyond rational understanding beyond the comfortable habits and orderly procedures of everyday life, where reality can be experienced anew, as if looking back from the other side. Um, and it, it goes on and on from that with a, a beautiful, um, Vaughan Oliver, so he said, that's generally where music takes me, takes me, says Oliver. That's why I listen to it, to change or enhance my mood, to take me elsewhere. It, it tickles things in me and takes me into a different state of mind, a dreamlike state. Um, and I think you can kind of, you get that from, from looking at his work to some extent, you know, this relationship between sitting and listening and looking at these things. And it, it you know, it's a kind of more than a sum of its parts in a, in a way, it, it kind of, 
in that case, one plus one, you know, equals at least three or four. So, yeah. Well, it's your turn. Okay. Um, so, um, I was going to, I'm doing it kind of chronologically, so they're getting younger. <laughs> so, um, my next one is Stefan Sagmeister. So, um, I was going to show this first. This is um, this is a book called oh, Sagmeister. I know, I know that book. Yeah, I don't have it, but I know it, which has a, a kind of very interesting right. thing on the front cover, which he does on some of his sleeves. But I pulled this book out because I wanted to talk about how how he's kind of brave and he he doesn't shirk away from things. Um, this is a poster. Um, that he designed for the AIGI. So he's giving a lecture at the, uh, what does the AIG stand for? AIG American AIG Institute AIG. of Graphic Artists. Graphic Design, that's it. So he's, he's doing a lecture there, and this is his poster to get people to come along. And basically, he tried cutting all, all the details into his own flesh himself with a razor blade in the mirror. And he couldn't, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it all in reverse and he couldn't. So he got, they asked someone else in his studio to do it. And they said, no, they, they looked at the amount of type that I had to actually put on his body, including all the bloody small print down the bottom. Oh. And, they, <laughs> and they said, no, I'm not doing it. So they got the intern to do it. Oh, crap. <laughs> and it took, it took something like nine hours. Well, that seems like fast actually for that. Yeah, maybe. exactly. <laughs> with like, a, with oh, a blade. God. There's some, so, there's some art things that get so over the top, like, you know, probably know the photographer, Joel Peter Whitkin, who I think is incredible, but I can't, I would never own his work or put it up in my house. So people should yeah. check out Joel <laughs> Peter Whitkin. Nine Inch um, Nails did a video based on his work with skulls and brains and... Ugh. Yeah. But um, when I came across his kind of, um, his work for, for Sleeves, so this is, um, it was actually a friend of his band. Uh, this is... Uh, H.P. Zinker, Mountains of Madness. Don't know it. Yeah, I mean, it's quite rare, but um, again, he does this thing. Do you, does he always yeah. use the red, the red cases? The red, almost like 3D? Well, on, on, the, on this one. I mean, the lyrics on, on this um, talk about how um, life in New York City makes you sick in the head. Is, is one of the is one of the lyrics or one of the kind of resonances behind the, this album, and it's just that idea of kind of calm exterior, thinly disguising a kind of rage, which I, is is not peculiar to New York. It, you know, people people go to big cities all over the place, and they find this kind of yeah. People sit on the London Underground, and like they say, oh, no one's talking to each other, no one, but like. As soon as a kind of mad person or a drunk person gets on on the, no one kind of challenges him. They just kind of move away. There's this kind of simmering kind of like danger that sometimes lurks within big cities. I'm sure you've experienced that. So this was yeah. the kind of the thing about this kind of screaming man and this calm exterior. Um, and then uh, there's a picture of the band here as well. Uh, and if you slide it inside, then you get the kind of Ooh, skeleton. their, um, skeletons and stuff. Um, Interesting. And it runs, it runs all the way through the, the, the kind of booklet inside. That reminds but me. The, the, this, is, this is really difficult to do. To the point yeah. where the reason I mention it in Keep going. light of if that other... Um, that other poster by him is that um, to get record companies or most clients that have a format to get them to step outside regular forms of reproduction is very difficult. Um, so if you, if you want to, you know, suddenly find jewel cases that have a red tint like this is not easy. You know, it's costing extra money. Then you've got to print the inside and in special inks to make sure that this trick works. And then it even does some weird thing. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but 
it's got some strange lyrics ah. which crop up on, on the actual thing itself. That's funny but, you show um, that because as you were showing that, I was thinking of the CD and it turns out your guy did it. Do you have this? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I've got the same one here. Yeah. I was that's, thinking like that's the, exactly the Lou Reed. Um, yeah, yeah. Lou Reed one. Okay. I did, um, I didn't know. I don't know. I didn't know his name. Yeah. Stefan Sagmeister. I mean, he's yeah, yeah. originally from Austria, but he works in New York. This uh, is for Sire Records, obviously. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And originally that came with like a nasty sticker on it because, of course, the record company were horrified that That's you couldn't. Yeah, probably. And I think there was one on the front as well. Mine, yeah, mine had one on the front. Yeah, mine didn't, but it, on the back it had that, the barcode. But, you know, you, you can imagine the label going, you know, I, what the fuck? People don't know what the fuck it is. I know people, Warner Brothers and uh, Sire and we at the time. Um, in fact, there's a couple artists that I've been wanting to have a conversation with Jerry Hyden and uh, Tom Rashawn that were at Warner Brothers for uh, a number of years. And Tom went to Capitol and, and uh, Jerry went to A&M and, and did some amazing covers. Uh, so, but I didn't include them in this. Yeah, okay. Um, and so just doing those kind of things wow. costs quite a bit more money. I think with yeah. that red one, um, the, the the record company said no we can't afford to do that so he basically put his own money into it because he wanted to get he wanted you know, that was one of his first leaves he wanted to do more and he wanted it to be a kind of showcase this is what i can do and sure enough people like lou reed started phoning him up after that um but you do you know, stuff for your portfolio sometimes where it's not about the yeah money, it's exactly about the, yeah i i know i get it um, but, you know, it's also quite difficult just to get out of the way things done sometimes. I mean, this um, is, is a sleeve he, he did for um, David Byrne. I have that too. Okay. And um, but basically he went to, a, he found a model maker who could make this, um, this kind of model of David Byrne. Because the, the whole premise about this is that um, uh, he, he wanted to... <clears throat> have it about the the pop star as a commodity in a way and music as a commodity so there are the all these kind of things and then there's this weird thing inside where you can you know, well, there you go and you can spin spin the uh, the rec the the cd with a with a pointer on and it would pick and it would go to different moods and then each track on the back has got a kind of key that relates to the different moods of the tracks on there um you, you and i a lot of work if you and a i lot of work it, going into this yourself are you you're self-employed i assume right yeah you, yeah you know you, you could have a whole conversation about budgets where so many times and not just with record covers i get these concepts sent to me from my photographers and they're really cool concepts and they have no relationship to the budget they have they want yeah, to do this yeah. and this and this, but you know, there's sets and makeup artists and talent and whatever it takes and wardrobe, and it has no correlation to the budget, whether it's advertising or design or, you know. Yeah, I've had that primarily from advertising agencies where, yeah. Yeah. where people uh, sometimes directly from clients. I did. I was doing some stuff uh, ages and ages ago, some kind of film work for. Um, for a, for a client and they said oh yeah we'd like to go down the animation route and i was like okay well that's thinking immediately that's always expensive um and uh and then they said oh and we've seen this um commercial and they sent it to me and it was like it cost a fortune yeah yeah and then they told me their budget which was tiny and it's just like you know why are you why are we even having this conversation the irony and this is uh, the audience that is watching this probably has no idea of this stuff and they might be bored with this comment too but the most rewarding uh photo shoots i did in the 80s and in the early 90s with not advertising and not even record company stuff were were, were a corporate annual reports because there was a time where these designers were doing the coolest reports, annual reports, physical books that do every year for these companies. And they were elaborate printed pieces, beautifully photographed or illustrated. Yeah. And I just, I would collect them. I don't have any more, unfortunately, but I would work these great designers around the country in New York, Emin Company, Tibor Kelman, 
And, yeah. um, you know, people on the West Coast, this guy Tom Bonaro and Scott Miller and David Carson and those kind of people and Bill Cahan, who was out here doing these kind of really cool design, amazing pieces with typography and photography. And, you, you know, some would have more money than others, but you would you would have all this creative photo freedom and you'd get we work it out that I'd get maybe a hundred copies of the printed piece that I could set as samples to potential clients, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, there's a few more of, of okay. this guy's work that I just pulled out. I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, there's this, well, there's this one, which is uh, called propane which caused a lot of controversy because of this this photograph of this woman yeah. in, in the morgue, yeah, and it's got some it's got some pictures inside in in the booklet which are very. Um, I'm not even going to show them. Okay. Um, you can imagine, okay. but um, you know, it just caused kind of outrage, and in Europe, the distributor wouldn't take it. Um, so he 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 sent out this thing saying, "If you want the original cover, I'll send it to you," and they put it in a plain cover in Europe. Um, just like having an idea and taking it to its ultimate thing that it just causes so much kind of issue. Um, this is, this is, this is another one that I, I really like. Um, I don't know if you know this, this is um, block and timing is everything. I don't know. So it. having a conversation with, um, with block was like madly keen on Rothman's cigarettes. So all, all the tracks are timed in, in terms of like how long, how long <laughs> a cigarette would burn for for the track length but within within the actual packaging there's that, that's like a a real cigarette in the in the spine wow. i do like Which, the see i do love the uh, conceptual nature so, of it, the idea of the cigarette thing that appeals to me and i i hate cigarettes personally but i like yeah. the, i like the concept a lot i mean i can't even imagine going to most record companies and saying okay we want to put an actual cigarette in with the packaging. Like, I'm sure the can we do cigarette, that? The cigarette company like, probably gave them, them all the cigarettes for free. Yeah, and like, who's going to do it? And like, who are this army of, of people are going to sit down with, with the packaging and insert a cigarette into each one? And like, you know, it's just wow. so much hassle to go through. Most designers would just kind of go, okay, we won't do that then. We'll have a photograph of the band on the cover. But he's he's the guy who scratched all the details into his own body. So he's the guy who's just going to have an idea like that and just keep pushing until it, until it comes out. Uh, I've got a few more, this, this one for uh, Pat, Pat Metheny, where um, I, think I know that one. Yeah. He developed this kind of alternate alphabet based on symbols. And um, well, Pat Metheny doesn't seem the type of uh, artist to use him. It's interesting. Yeah. And like you can figure out what each letter is from this by aligning this wheel and then reading them off. And then is like, that Warner all, Brothers, all this, too? Is that Warner Brothers? All this, all this typography is like <laughs> try, wow. try reading the, the credits. You're going to have to sit down and work it all out. Is that Apparently, Warner Brothers? Like, hours, hours after this was released. You know, some fan worked it all out and posted it all online for people who did want to know. Uh, Warner Brothers, yeah. Yeah. So obviously, Warner Brothers and Sire used this guy a lot, repeated. So, you know, yeah. there I was an so. and I th to the design aesthetic. Yeah. I think it's, it's artists kind of going, this guy's really good. We want, we want a Stefan Sagmeister to cover. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then, and then if they've got enough clout within the record company, then the record company have got to kind of, Right. Invest and suck up the kind of pain that comes with <laughs> perhaps some of them, the, the more kind of outlandish things. I'm sure we both have stories of those kind of pain and projects. So, yeah. 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 Long nights putting things together when no one else would. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going with a, a classic and a, a, a one that everyone's been seeing lately. Uh, and he has two careers and a lot of people don't realize he had two careers and he came, comes from the world of advertising in the 50s. And that is uh, Reed Miles. I mean, you already talked and mentioned him in that book and that article. Yeah. Reed Miles uh, was uh, hired by Francis Wolf, who was one of the partners in the Blue Note Records. Francis Wolf, a photographer. Reed Miles was a photographer as well. And 
I just pulled albums that are mostly his use of typeface on these great blue note covers. He did a lot of great stuff with photography. I didn't include those as much, mostly uh, Francis Wolfe's photographs, but occasionally yeah. he would do his own. But obviously this, the, the typeface, the repetitiveness nature, obviously this album that which in the uh, 90s became like us three, the, the hip hop, uh, trip hop band, it's sort of a variation of this blue note stuff. This is a Horace Parlin record. I just love the yeah. type thing on these. Uh, Dexter Gordon's Go, Art Blakey's uh, Jazz Mess Messenger's Night in Tunisia. One of the most famous ones, um, Midnight Blue, uh, later parodied by uh, yeah, Joe Jackson. Album. Or no, uh, Elton, uh, Elvis Costello did it. The oh, yeah, 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 Simply Blue, country, yeah. Country album. There's plenty of more. He did virtually every record read miles and later in his career he left new york after the whole blue note change up with uh, liberty records and he moved to la and became just a photographer read miles inc and that's when i i think that's when i met him and i when i met him in the late 80s in la i didn't realize it was the same guy who was doing the blue note covers i was kind of naive at the time one of the one I don't have here, he did a lot of his photo studio thing was doing photographs of a lot of people. He was very ironically influenced by um, Norman Rockwell, his paintings okay. of these groups yeah. of people, very Americana. He did the cover, which I don't have here, of uh, Chicago's Greatest Hits, where the all the band, all eight members, nine members are on the scaffold painting the that boring Chicago yeah, logo yeah, yeah, yeah. over and over. And one I'll just show that I didn't even realize until I looked him up that he did was this album cover, uh, Bob Dylan's uh, album, okay. The Basement Tapes. So it's all these groups of very, I mean, obviously, if you know Norman Rockwell, this is, doesn't look like a Norman yeah. Rockwell only no. because of the multi people thing. But his stuff is very Americana like that. He was one of, in the 80s, he was one of the big L.A advertising photographers did a lot of ad campaigns and had this whole and he did some tv and some commercial work but um i think reed miles is an important thing and and his careers are so different from his blue note jazz career which these albums now i mean they have been so iconic but now and they've been uh, replicated and and uh, you know taken yeah. on in different versions and new versions by new artists because they're so iconic and they're so beautiful. So um, read Miles. Yeah. I well, I, is yeah, I pulled a couple of his out because I thought you might be talking about just the use of photography on, on sleeves. And and I remember, you know, seeing some of these yep. uh, from a long time ago. And just um, the fact that he had, I mean, if you kind of break it down, you know, the amount of white space is roughly equivalent to how much he's given to the photograph of the artist for its time. I'm sure that felt like a pretty brave thing to do, to be honest with you. And he would, that bold, he would be that bold with the type, but, but yeah. also to be that kind of brave with photography to the cropping of photographs can be such a kind of dynamic thing. Right. Um, and then also, I presume this is one of, one of his, this, Donald Byrd that he did several well, of this. Okay. So kind of... That's a different one. That is um that record that never him? that tape never came out back in the day and they had this tape. And so they okay. recreated a Reed Miles style thing for that tone poet release. Okay, so that's done in, in his in his style then. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's oh, a recent that like year or two, right? Yeah. Okay. Well that's that's less that's probably that's okay. less interesting. But you know taking black and white photography like, like that and tinting it and turning it sideways and and being that kind of playful with photography, I think was, that's the earliest kind of examples I, I kind of and remember seeing would, that stuff. And sometimes he would do that big, I, don't, I didn't grab any of that, that big block of type or several color types. And he'd do like a little tiny head photograph. Yeah, just exactly. Stuck in there, which usually photographers go crazy, but you know, Francis Wolf being the guy at the sessions, I don't think it was an ego thing at that point. It was whatever would work for like Sidewinder for the project. Uh, and selling and Sidewinder, sure. ironically, is one of the biggest selling Blue Note albums in its day. That was a yeah, hit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, 
um, next I chose um, somebody I know quite well, which is uh, Jonathan Barnbrook. Ah. So um, Jonathan Barnbrook, so he's a, an English um, graphic designer. Um, uh, in theory, I, I kind of taught him very, very briefly. So he studied at um, St. Martin's School of Art like I did. Then he went to the Royal College of Art like I did. And by the time he got there, I'd been employed to do a little bit of teaching there. And um, I remember seeing his his degree show when he finished at St. Martin's and thinking, fuck me, he is good. This kid is really <laughs> good. You know, what, what am I going to teach him when he comes next? He could teach me a thing or two. I've had students like that, but yeah. Yeah, really just like, oh, my God. Um, anyway, um, roll the clock forward a few years and... Um, I used to have a studio in Archer Street in London, which is a little road just around the corner from Piccadilly Circus. And um, if you go back to the like, 30s, 40s and 50s, there's a picture of, of Archer Street in London. And it's where all the jazz musicians used to go to, um, to try and get gigs. Um, I think lots of the music agents were based in Archer Street. Anyway, we had, I had a little studio there on the second floor um and he had a studio on the first floor a tiny little studio and um one day we had a bigger studio he had a tiny one and one day he came upstairs and said oh hi um i've got a favor to ask i've got a guest coming to visit me and um as you know we don't have a a toilet within our studio we use a communal toilet downstairs which is pretty horrible but you guys have got a nice toilet if my if my special guest comes as he said he's going to with his wife and if he needs to use the loo can he use your toilet and we, we were like well yeah who is it and he said it's david bowie and his wife hmm. so we sat at our desks working away the rest of the day and every time the doorbell went or someone or a <laughs> courier came we were all just like <gasps> Who is it? And it's not David Bowie, of course. Um, and he never came. And um, one of our colleagues who'd been out on a photo shoot came back and he walked through the door and we kind of went, oh. and he just said, you'll never guess who I've just seen on the stairs. And we all went, David Bowie? And he was like, how did you know? <laughs> anyway. So David he, Bowie came up. He didn't come to our office. He just came to John's studio downstairs. Oh, and he, um, he never used our toilet. We, we, you know, we didn't have to, pr we didn't have to pr 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 kind of protect that toilet seat forevermore and uh, sell it on eBay. Right. Um, but anyway, he struck up a good friendship with David Bowie and he did um, several albums for him. I mean, this one, I mean, the word heathen kind of means um, like not believing in religion or not believing in uh, and for this particular one, this, this is why he put the type upside down. It's, it's a kind of an anti thing. He was, he was already handed, the, the photograph was already taken. Um, and um, the photographs by Marcus Klinko. And then um, he, within the kind of booklet and everything else, he found these old photographs of, um, paintings that have been defaced. Um, and again, it was a way of taking something that is culturally very valuable and kind of almost like canceling it or um, defacing something that is of cultural value. So again, it kind of had a struck a chord with him. And I think uh, through John's friendship with, um, with David Bowie, which grew, they began to do things which, again, record companies would probably have, have, have frowned on. So, um, you know, when they talked about doing his first proper studio album for 10 years, and I think David Bowie was probably talking to him about, you know, the weight of expectation or the producing something when you've got such an iconic body of work, you know, behind you to be judged every time. You know, they had this talk about, you know, taking something, which is obviously that, and almost kind of saying, okay, forget all that stuff in the past. It's something new, you know. Um, and, I had um, an interview with him because I, I had so many heated debates about the Next Day album cover. 
and I absolutely love it. And people were saying it's lazy, it doesn't mean anything, what a bunch of crap it was. And I, I remember reading an interview with him at the time about that, and I think it's brilliant. He, he showed, yeah. there's an article showing some of the concepts he presented, I guess. And um, I, I just love that. I think it's ballsy as hell. Yeah, no, it's really brave. It's really brave. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the record company faced with like <laughs> doing that to his face would just be like freaking out if it wasn't for the fact that it's David Bowie. And if he likes it, it's well, look how much, you know? Look how much they saved on the budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. Right. Um, I mean, and um, yeah, so there's other things. So um, this is, uh, do you know John Fox? Yes, a British kind of electronic artist. So, I, um, I mean, this is this is a um, an artist that um, Jonathan Barnbrook had always liked his music, and having done some uh, some work for David Bowie, he kind of thought, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'll I'll just contact John Fox and say, I've always loved your music. I'd love to do a record sleeve. Look, I've done one for David Bowie. Um, That's a good so uh, resume. Is, builder yeah exactly it's like opens some doors um and um i think it includes a photograph of a sculpture that um, um john fox had something to to do with and this uh title european splendor is why he's kind of doing this kind of victorian cartouches and and uh, doing all this stuff with the with very kind of calligraphic um typography and yeah it feels very contemporary in a way as well um, and then, of course, there's this black star I love that. sleeve, which you know is everything is black on on black, but printed with, um, I think, with um, varnishes, possibly um, ultraviolet sealed varnishes to make them really pop. Um, Do you know if he knew if Bowie was dying when he designed that? Uh, I, I believe he didn't know. Yeah, most people didn't. The musicians yeah. and the band didn't know. Yeah, and in fact, well, that Joy Division one closer, you know, there was a whole thing with the band before that went out because it's got a tomb on the front cover, worrying oh, right. what, that they shouldn't release it, you know, that it's somehow in bad taste. But um, Ian Curtis hung himself, right? Yeah, yeah, but but they decided to go with it. Um, so yeah, the uh, I mean, the inside of, of the booklet is. That's all these beautiful graphics as well. Love that record. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it is a, it is a good. Yeah, just for the, I mean, you can't get away, that. you know, we, did, we haven't even touched on it, the, the whole discussion about the pleasure and the aesthetic. I said aesthetic again. Someone hates that I say aesthetic, but of all these album covers and the artwork and the books involved and the, and how important this is. I mean, not just our generation, people are discovering it again compared to CDs and obviously, you know, I'm not against, haven't been against CDs, had my 20 year excursion yeah. there, but there's nothing like seeing these and, and these books and all the things you can do and then reading the lyrics yeah. too. Yeah, in, interestingly, the, the final Jonathan Barnbrook one I'm going to show is, is this one it's called Fragile Self. And um, this is actually um, John Barnbrook's own project. So uh, he's so into, interested in electronic music um, he um, he got together with um, um, his partner uh, Anil Akan sorry if I pronounced that name wrong Jonathan um, and this comes in so this comes in vinyl and it comes in a CD or if you want a download of it you get a free book with it so wow. even though the, you're buying a digital thing you get something physical to look at nice. um, and this this album is all about kind of um, mental health in a way. Um, these is that recent? Um, nine, 2019. Yeah. So you, you you can slide this in in different ways, and it and it would um, push the different image into into the little window inside. Die cut, sad to the price. So die cut um printed even black inside the sleeve that most people won't even notice you can tell when it's a graphic designer doing it themselves printed on really beautiful stock none of that shiny nasty stuff 
but uh, beautiful uncoated stock. Um, yeah, it, it feels beautiful. Well, okay. okay, my second to the last one is probably the most obvious choice, probably the most prolific team of uh, designers in the 1970s and 80s and record covers. And I couldn't do this without talking about hypnosis. I know you mentioned um, Strom, yeah. Storm Thorgerson and then Aubrey Powell, who uh, started this uh, iconic design firm and obviously follow along. I mean, I'm not gonna even show the cover of Dark Side of the Moon. And ironically, it's not one of my favorite at all. I'm not a big, big fan of that cover. I, it became such a big, between the album yeah. and the cover, it's not a fan of mine. To me, the most perfect Pink Floyd album for me, and I don't know what it is, and I, every time I see it, I smile, is this album. And <laughs> um, I just love Adam Hart Mother. I love you know reading the story of him driving around looking for cows. I think I think it was Storm who got out and just photographed the cow and uh, the perfect cow. And I love how it originally came out without the band title. Yeah. I think the sticker on it. Later copies had the album title. Uh, this book has everything they ever did. You uh, people have obviously seen T Rex. What's interesting about them compared to a lot of other designers is their whole, and coming from the world of advertising myself a little bit, is their production value was so high in creating these real, again, pre-Photoshop, these real sets and concepts, and obviously, you know, making a giant pig going over Battersea uh, Power Station yeah. that got away literally and, and floated down the Thames, I guess. Um, Sid Barrett, beautiful photography. Again, conceptual, obviously doing so many covers for 10CC. One of my favorites, yeah. uh, Deceptive Bends, and they did, uh, uh, well, they did all of them around this time, uh, sh from sheet music, I think, on. Uh, but conceptually, photographically, uh, in terms of retouching and putting the things together and compositing, again, long before um, Photoshop, one of my favorites is McCartney-esque, and it's not the band. Obviously, the series of McCartney. How simple mm. is this when you think about it? I mean, yeah. I just love it. Even uh, though uh, Wings Over Speed of Sound is not one of my favorite albums, they, they, I think, as I recall, they literally did this. Uh, I, don't, I didn't bring it here, but the, this marquee of a theater in Leicester Square, I believe. Maybe it was Leicester Square. And did the theater where Wings of the Speed of Sound. It wasn't created in a studio on a, a board. Yeah. They actually put the things and photographed it and then reworked it. Um, and obviously just had all the stickers in it and uh, the, the things and probably one of their more con uh, con controversial ones uh, was this. You know, oh, yeah. anytime you have young people, young women naked, young girls naked, uh, but a fantastic cover. They did a lot of stuff for Led Zeppelin. I mean, I could go, you know, you, you could go through that book for hours and hours and hours and recognize all these amazing, you know, conceptual yeah. type covers they did. Um, now this one I wanted to show because I, I've showed this on my channel many times, this XTC cover. And what I love yeah, about- it's the, great. The story goes that XTC, I guess the band goes into the office of hypnosis and they're presenting ideas and XTC or Andy Partridge, whoever hates everything, doesn't like anything. And they're walking out and there's like a huge version of this leaning against a wall somewhere, all this, right? And it's kind of this generic record cover they presented to all these bands and every band passed on it. And it talks about, this is a record cover. This writing is the design upon the record cover. Design has helped to sell the record and they go this whole thing. Of course, they put in XTC and, and uh, the name of the yeah. album go to, but it was this generic thing and they just loved it. And um, I don't know if anyone's ever read this whole cover anyway. I mean, someone has, I'm sure. <laughs> They're sitting, back, they got back and got stoned and read the whole thing, but I love this uh, album cover. And of course, I'm just gonna show this. This isn't, this came out in the CD era. This is the live, um, uh, Pink Floyd album from the mid nineties yeah. called Pulse. And what was kind of fun about this, when you saw this in a record shop, CD shop, it had this kind of wrapped around 
string with a with a little LED light that blinked, okay. that pulsated, and apparently it pulsated for years when you had that until it eventually, I guess, died out. I never had the CD of this, and uh, but I remember every time you'd go in the in the Pink Floyd section in the CD shop, you'd see these little things blinking. And uh, I don't remember if there was a switch or something to turn it on, but it seemed to stay on forever. But um, I won't get into all the details of these records. But to me, hypnosis um, is one of the more important. It became almost like a, a brand upon itself, onto itself in a way of, of this cottage industry. And they got into video making. And I mean, I don't know what your experience is. I'm sure we all, everybody has at least one or probably many uh, albums designed by hypnosis yeah i've got i've got one or two although yeah i got rid of some of my records a long time ago and lots of the prog stuff kind of went went by the wayside at that point right i mean yeah i mean all this these conceptual elaborate visualization storytelling stuff you know yeah. i mean everyone's seen their work and um you know ufo very conceptual. Yeah, I mean, they're a, an image of the time, obviously, but but, uh, but they really did elevate the whole notion of a record sleeve to something far more. I mean, that one for XTC is is like purely is almost like conceptual art compared to and, exactly. And they and they took. I mean, they're they're basically a production house. They did the photography, they did the design, they did the post product, they did everything. They didn't just you know hire a photographer to do a shoot. As far as I know, maybe occasionally they did early on, but um, they were doing everything within their group uh, from, yeah, from beginning yeah. to end and work with. I mean, Pink Floyd, obviously, is an example. They worked with them even throughout some of their stage shows and, and presentations and tours mm -hmm. and everything, replicating, you know, the, whether it's the wall or animals or any of those. So, yeah. The other thing I really like about them is there's kind of ambiguity built into those sleeves. It's like it. It assumes that, that the viewer has some intelligence and that you would want, you don't want to just be handed stuff on a plate to just go, well, here's a really obvious idea. And that's that. It's like, you kind of think, what's that? Why is, why is he doing that? Why is he shaking hands? Why is that guy on fire? You know what I mean? They kind of pose right. questions. They um, tell us a visual story that um, yeah, may I not mean, be I, a specific answer. I mean, there are some, you know, there are kind of things like, like that which are kind of ideas graphics which are just like you just get it immediately and then there's nothing left there's nothing to work out it's not particularly aesthetic it's just the concept quick concept which is more like an appetizing thing because exactly. it's here and then it's gone and you're on to the next ad or but um the hypnosis leaves kind of there's far more artistic intent there so they stick they stick with you and they don't just fill in all, they, you know, they don't just fill in all the blanks. They leave I you to interpret they, them yourself. I wonder how how they dealt with budgets because their things weren't cheap. Uh, yeah, and, um, you know, I can't even imagine. Yeah, it's not surprising that they're mostly pretty big artists. Yeah, but even some of them, as they were getting, I mean, I guess the UFO sell a lot of records. I don't know. Maybe you know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. The T Rex thing is iconic, and that's not necessarily an expensive thing. I just how they took that great photograph out and did almost True. like a, a screen, what do you call it, a, of that shot or, you know, strip out and silhouetted yeah. or something. Yeah, It's possibly all done in the dark room or something, yeah. Exactly, um, yeah. I mean, Photoshop... Yeah, I, I guess there, there must have been conversations that go on beforehand, like, like how much money have you got before we come up, before we come back to you with an idea that involves hiring a helicopter and going to the desert and all the other stuff, you know, if you've only got, you know, 500 pounds, then let's talk about that right now, you know, because yeah. yeah. there's nothing worse than having a great idea and then finding out you, no one can do it. No, no. Okay, I guess, is this your final one? Final one, yeah. So um, I picked somebody quite different and somebody much more, um, uh, slightly more modern which is um his name is um torsten posselt and if i've got his name wrong <laughs> in terms of pronunciation then i deeply apologize so he runs a studio called studio torsten posselt now 
And this is an album for um, uh, Oliver Arnold's. It includes this strange uh, little little device on the front and the, and the back that kind of comes out. And this is um, kind of Icelandic, kind of neoclassical music. And um, it's, it's printed on really beautiful uh, uncoated paper um, that has a real kind of texture to it. It's, it's quite difficult to get photographs to kind of sit well on uncoated paper. It's more like cartridge paper that you would like to draw on, but it has a real kind of tactile quality. And the, and the booklet inside contains for photography and, and each one has a, um, has a kind of time signature next to it. So as you listen to the album, different, different pictures were chosen that kind of evokes the, the mood of different pieces of music. Ooh. Nice. Um, and um, typography is very simple, very elegant. Um, another album he did um, recently, also for Oliver Arnold's, comes with this plastic sleeve, but the plastic sleeve is actually printed. I guess a kind of conversation that, oh, bloody hell, all, all of our lovely artworks end up in these bloody plastic sleeves by designers. So this one actually comes with its own right. that includes part of the graphics. Wow. Which is very pretty. And um, I mean, you know, it suits the, the music perfectly. It's very contemplative, um, neoclassical music. Um, I'm glad with the resurgence uh, of vinyl, there's been an, a, 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 an attention to gray cover art again of some of these artists. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, Even the minimal is, smaller artist, yeah. This is one for uh, Niels Fromm. So he, he released, um, three albums which um, were the kind of off cuts from um, one of his big albums um, of 2019 and 2020, he had all these extra bits left over. So he released a kind of a blue one and a brown, a brown one and a red one. So this is the kind of all three of them together. So there are, there are three, uh, three discs within, within here. But again, it's printed on uh, almost industrial craft paper. Um, so the ink really soaks in. And again, it has a, a really kind of beautiful tactile quality to it. Um, and then um, this one, which is, I forget the title of this one, it's called Tender Symmetry, um, which is a classical album by Michael Price. And basically, um, these are like kind of often vocal, classical vocal pieces, and they were recorded in strange pieces of architecture. So that's where the, the kind of cover comes from, the kind of sunshine coming through a skylight in one of these locations. And again, inside there's a booklet, um, which includes, you know, photographs of them doing field recordings in unusual um, interiors where they, where they recorded these voices. I'm always curious how they get the budgets. Cause I know I've done, you know, estimates for my photographers and projects with designers to print up beautiful books like that for promo. Those aren't cheap. <laughs> no, no, no. They're and not at all. You're putting that in addition to an album cover in a book. And that's what a, a 20 page book, 18 page, whatever, 24 page book. You're putting it in an album. They're probably pressing, if they're pressing five thousand copies, that's a lot. Maybe not that many. You know, two thousand. Yeah. It's amazing they have the budget to do that, and it probably sells for the equivalent of what yeah. twenty five, I mean, thirty dollars. This, this is on a raised tape, so it's kind of a British label. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, I was going to say maybe they're just used to kind of promote live performances. I guess I mean, so. I've done some I've done some kind of art catalogs where they're practically selling them at cost price because yeah. ultimately it's it's not they're not looking to make money off of out of the actual product they 
that the revenue stream comes from somewhere else. So I don't know whether some of these these albums operate on a similar kind of level. Um, this is um, an album by uh, rival rival consoles called Persona. That's that's beautiful. Uh, which is very it's very beautiful. Yeah, it's just texture and just these little eyes. Wow. And um, actually, it's got a bit of art inside, which I'm not quite so keen on. But now, when you bought, when you purchase these, are you purchasing these because of the cover, or do you know the music ahead of time? Uh, well, I usually listen to the music first. Um, uh, Dream on, on on Apple iTunes usually, right, right, um, and give it a play a few times and kind of think, oh yeah, I'd like to hear that for real, and then I'll get I'll get the record. Um, there's another. I love this one. Um, this is Oliver Arnold's and Neil's Farm, and it's just called Stare. <laughs> Quite wow. uh, obviously, it's kind of rather mesmerizing cover. Uh, with just the, like the, this series is like me, cent, cent, like me center of to, the center of this of the record this series is like me visiting the museum of modern art just one of their exactly, galleries exactly yeah very beautiful and then the final one i chose by him is by um a pianist called otto a totland um and this one i don't know if you can see this so the this this is cloth here, and it has foil uh, lettering, and this is cut within a, a kind of a, a cardboard sleeve. So um, it's almost like a piece of book binding in a way. You know, where you get the kind of half spine that runs down the spine of some books that's in cloth. Um, and then inside, um, there's a beautiful, photograph and, uh, i think that's just the yeah it's just the record that i've put in a plastic sleeve but um but yeah just just really interesting having probably spent the money on really beautiful paper it's like feels like handmade paper that's it's not printed blue it's that it's that color all the way through it and this kind of cloth and the foil blocking just gives a very kind of precious I don't know, you take the record out, you put it on the turntables, you settle down. It feels like a very contemplative kind of process that you kind of go through. And the, and the, the sleeve feels a part of that. And it, it kind of, the two things kind of marry up very nicely, really. That's where our collections, our record collections, no offense to compact discs, no offense to compact, yeah. but our record collections in a way are also our, our own galleries our own galleries of artwork. And um, For sure. you know, people always comment on my videos and say, all those records, how, wh how, why do you need that many records? How can you have time to listen to them all? I look at them, to me, it's like a library. It's my library. I have listened to all my records. I don't listen to them all, all the time. When I'm in the mood, I don't wanna go and stream something uh, in terms of the enjoyment. I get it about people streaming, but I like to pull a record out. I like to look at the cover. I like to look at the artwork. So I have my own little gallery, especially these last two years when we haven't been able to maybe go to museums and galleries as much as we'd like to. It's been a joy to pull these records and doing these videos like this and showcasing it. Um, my last is I'm going back full circle in a way, starting with the Beatles. But uh, to me, uh, even though the Beatles obviously did Rubber Soul and Revolver are two iconic covers and very special, you can't deny how special this album was when it came out. And forget the music for a second because everyone says, oh, Sergeant Pepper, I'm tired of that. You know, I'm of an age, I was 13, just prior to almost turning 13 when this album came out. And this was a game changer, not only because of obviously of the music, but this cover. And I'm gonna talk about Peter Blake because Peter Blake was a designer of this cover uh, he is a painter, uh, a collage artist, very influenced by assemblage, like uh, I'm, I have to sound creatively French there, but like an artist like uh, Joseph Cornell, who did these box art pieces and three di dimensional yeah. things. And uh, I love that. And obviously with this album, not only the setup, and if you've seen, I have books of Michael Cooper, the photographer who not only took this cover picture, took a satanic majesty's request a, for a few months later 
that is mm. very eerily similar in a way. Um, and of course, uh, the insert and everything, but there's a whole collage aspect. And, you know, obviously way, you know, decades be before Photoshop, where they actually had to cut out all these uh, heads of these uh, art of these uh, celebrities and famous people in history, get permission, build these sets in the studio. You know, I think this cost, I think was something like $5,000 at the time, which is a lot of money then. But when you think of what album covers cost now to build this, to take the picture, to yeah. get paid, to do it, uh, to bring the dirt in, to do the flowers, just everything involved in here is really important. So Peter Blake, I, I, I've i seen, a, I, I don't have it handy there because I'm re removing my uh, books around. I have three or four books of the work of Peter Blake, but I do want to show a couple other things. There's Paul uh, Weller's uh, Stanley Road. Again, it's the, you know, montage effect, assembly, collage effect of his album covers. And yeah. obviously when you see this, I mean, it's very similar to Face Dances. And the thing about Face Dances, the Who album, is probably my least favorite Who album. He, Peter Blake did not paint all these. He, he uh, got a series of famous artists to do portraits of the various Who members. So you got artists like uh, Richard Hamilton. Richard Hamilton may not be a household word to a lot of people here, but Richard Hamilton is a sort of fine modern conceptual artist who designed the cover of the White Album. Now, some wankers out there will say that's no design, it's just a plain, there's a <laughs> concept behind the White Album with the emboss and the number, and that's a whole other yeah. conversation. Uh, who else is on here? Um, David Hockney, I forgot which one is David Hockney. Uh, David Hockney did a cover of one of the portraits on here, as well as um, Clive Barker, uh, you know, the horror, uh, artist uh, Clyde Barker. So yeah. I love that he took these artists and made this cover. And then lastly, I need to show this. And of course, people are going to say, why are you showing this artist? But the last thing I have of um, Peter Blake is this painting. And I do love the cover of this album. And this is Eric Clapton. <laughs> and yeah. um, it is a beautiful painting. I think yeah, I, I he's mean, a very fine painter. He's a great painter. If I had a portrait done of me, a heroic portrait in the National Portrait Gallery or something, not that they're going to do one of Mazzy, but I would love Peter Blake to paint me because I think he's just, um, you know, it's not very interesting there really. I think that's kind of boring actually. That's lazy. Uh, but um, I think this is a brilliant yeah. cover. Again, uh, you got Peter Blake's name on it. You don't even have uh, Mr. Clapton's name on it at all, but uh, I love that. So I think Peter Blake uh, is an obviously is an important artist. I think he's a Sir Peter Blake. Maybe I could be wrong. Uh, you could be right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a fun conversation. Um, it is. Yeah, we could go on for hours, and maybe someday we'll do another chapter. Just really quickly, I think everyone out there who collects records needs at least one book on record covers. Amongst my favorite is Total Records. This is put out by Aperture. Aperture is a, a publisher and organization that promotes uh, photography. So these are only this is photography and the art of album covers, the whole history of it only from the, the photographic side. Uh, there's 1000 record covers. This is something very cheap you can get. Tashin does these great art books yeah. and they're very inexpensive and they're lovely. Yeah, just to have, yeah, yeah and there's, you know, I think they've done large versions and small versions. If you're into the jazz scene, another great Tashin book of the same formatted jazz covers, great formatted book of all these wonderful uh, jazz covers. Yeah, I think I've got that one down there. Exactly. I mean, you have these things. And of course, I think, I think that one's behind me, that one, jazz uh, covers. And then Tashin, obviously there's rock covers and art rock covers. And what's great, I think it's this one. I always get confused. Oh, there's the hypnosis cover. I think yeah, again, yeah. to me, it doesn't really do much for me, Dark Side of the Moon, the cover. But what's great about one of these, they, they listed by designers and they list sections of designers like Von Oliver and, and uh, Peter Samerville and Peter Blake, things like that. So I think, oh, Peter Blake did the um, Christmas, uh, the, yeah. the, you know, I forgot about that. I could have pulled that. But I think it's really good for everyone to have at least one of these kind of books in their collection. It's just kind of a nice yeah, thing for to sure. refer to. 
right so yeah all right um don't hang up when i push the button for a second david okay. but thank you for watching i'll put a link to david ellis's uh, channel all the way in london so i don't think toll charges apply you can watch his videos too thank you mazzy loves you and um, thank you we're gonna stop <laughs>